Again, education only. The content of the webinar is personal opinion of the moderator, knowledgetrade.com. The content is not constitute investment, financial, or tax advice. Intro.com is not set now. Our ability for content consumer during this session. So we're getting onto the topic now of how banks trade your money. Now, <laughs> it used to be in the day where you give a bank your money, you would get interest on that money, and for that interest, that payment they gave you, they would go off and make other investments and then you know grow their business. Not really the same these days, is it? You know, the world's changed in such a dramatic way and such a dramatic pace that nobody really knows I guess what the function of banks is we know we need them we know we can't function without them but we're not quite sure we can trust them now when we talk about the kind of the banks you have to remember that banks facilitate a lot of things they facilitate investment um, holding of money trading of money and everything to do with how the world really revolves um, it's pretty sad, I guess, in some respects, that um, the average person has no control over, you know, their bank account. You know, it doesn't matter what they say, what they do. You know, they have to adhere to the interest rates that the banks you know, give them, which are obviously controlled by the government. But banks, you know, have, have done a lot of things that are not necessarily in the interest of the average person. But, again, we're not here to uh, talk about the banks as in what they do to, with, with our money. We had to do, we don't, uh, well, I guess we are and we aren't. At the end of the day, you have to put your money in the bank. That is the rules. You know, you can't just keep your money in a mattress. So, unfortunately, you have to put your money into any kind of financial institution to be able to get access to it and, you know, to have any kind of real security. But it's really changed out of all recognition where, you know, you don't go to see your bank manager anymore and he knows who you are and knows your family knows what to lend you, you know, what you're capable of. It's all online. Everything's, you know, algorithms. Everything's, you know, kind of down to, you know, computers yet again. Now, when you come down to how the banks trade your money, you have to think that over $5 trillion is traded every single day in the FX markets alone. So $5 trillion, that's an insane amount of money, an insane amount of money every single day. So hundreds of financial products are traded simultaneously. And that's why we see the markets move. We have bonds, FX, CFDs, shares, commodities, and then the futures market. When you think about it, really, banks on their own account for 40% of global trading volumes. That's a huge amount. Obviously, you've got you know, your hedge funds, you've got your institutions, you know, your pension funds. But essentially, really, banks make the world go around. You know, they trade, money gets moved around, and that's just the way it works. The majority of money that's held by banks, obviously, it's huge. You know, it's huge amounts of money, and it's hugely trusted. We don't, I think the biggest thing for me is that people don't understand is how the, um, all people in the world are kind of pre-programmed. You know, you go out, you get a job. You get a job. You earn a wage, get your wage, you put that money in the bank. And these things are obviously, they haven't changed, you know, in, in that respect. But the world around us has changed. At the end of the day, you know, money, you know, we can have money with cash, PayPal, credit cards, all your bitcoins, all different mediums. But money is still money. But we still go back to the bank of our basis of thinking that's worth safe. <laughs> you know, that's what's kind of laughable. Is that really safe? Is, is Are banks the safest places to have your money? Are banks the safest people to invest your money? Are banks what we should be relying on to move the economy and base our decisions on? I think probably not. I guess since 2008, 20 banks in the UK have been fined a total of 235 billion in trading, you know, in trading fines. So, you know, a quarter of a trillion in trading fines. That's a lot of money. But at the end of the day, nobody from the banking industry seems to go to jail. A few guys get a slap on the wrist, but nobody that created, you know, the credit crunch, subprime mortgages, you know, fiscal cliff, whatever you want to call it, nobody's actually really been prosecuted for that. But we all need banks. So if we all need banks, we'll get on with it. You know, we stop worrying about it. 
So trading fines, I guess if, if banks can afford to pay such huge amounts, you know, how are they making the money from trading? You know, I guess this is where the kind of retail versus institutional come into play. Retail is the average person. You know, a person trading the markets is retail. They're a retail customer, the non-professional, the non-institutional. And, you know, why is that different? You know, how does it come into the markets? Well, it comes into the markets because people want to trade. People have their own independence, their own freedom, and people believe they can do whatever they want. And they can. That's the whole, that's a great thing about democracy. That's a great thing about, you know, being in the Western world. You can do whatever you want. But you have to realize, I guess, that the retail trader doesn't have the same power as an institutional trader. Okay, Somebody who's trading somebody else's money won't A, think the same, B, won't treat it the same, and C, doesn't have the same emotional connection. If you're a small retail trader, and small can be half a million pounds, that's still tiny in institutional terms. You know, if you're a small half million pound retail trader, and you come across somebody institutional who's got billions, your opinions <clears throat> are going to clash. And the ability of what you can do in the short term, obviously, going to clash. And again, that's what banks know. Banks are the middlemen. They play upon the difference between retail and institution. They play upon the difference between pain tolerances, risk tolerances, and how people can interact in the market. And that's what's really important you know for you to understand you know as any kind of trader you might be a brand new trader an experienced trader the whole point is there's always always in life someone bigger than you always someone more powerful than you and it doesn't matter if you're sat here and you're worth a million pounds whatever i've got clients worth billions okay billions of pounds there's always someone richer always until you get the top of the pile there's one person that's the richest. But what do they do with the money? They don't control their money. They're not even interested in their money. Right? So, again, it's all a self-fulfilling prophecy. Retail traders get involved in the market to have opinion. Institution money gets involved in the markets because they can manipulate the retail traders. And that's what we're here to understand. How banks can make you lose your own money trading with your own money. I mean, how ironic is that? I guess there's lots of terms using the markets. Short squeeze, pin bar, stop grabber, a fake out, a flip. Now, these terms, again, are all there to describe how the traders in the markets, again, from the kind of institutional style, you know, flip out the retail traders. I remember when I first started trading about 20 years ago, um, in the bun market, there was a guy called the flipper, and he traded off his yachts. And he was very successful and was very rich. And he basically just flipped every, you know, other price in the bund. And, uh, you know, made a couple of thousand lots of time. Now, these are the things that have been around forever. There's nothing new in trading. There's nothing new in the world. There are people that can squeeze you out of positions, can stop out your trade, you can flip the market, make it fake out. These are the things we have to kind of, these are the things you have to realize as a trader. That's the market does. The markets exist because there's many people in it. The markets exist because it can survive in many different guises. But at the end of the day, the retail traders are the lowest of the low. The absolute lowest of the low. It's the professional traders above that. It's the institutions above that. It's the hedge funds and the central banks are even higher up the scale. <coughs> it's not because of money. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, what, you, you know, you class things as, you know, what's fair, or what's right, or what's real. At the end of the day, people that have more money are always going to win the longer game because they have more money. So institutions and banks use things like short squeezes, pin bars, stop grabbers, fake outs, and flips to get retail traders out because retail traders have the smallest stop, the least amount of money, the least experience, and the most pain threshold. So they're the easiest target. This is why, you know, you think if you ever play poker, what are you trying to do? You're not trying to win the money. Well, I guess you are, but you're trying to find the fish, the weakest player. And that's what the markets do on, a, on a, a global scale from a professional standpoint. 
They're trying to find the weakest people. And that's generally on the retail side of it. So retail traders, I mean, before we start to look at you know how banks trade the markets, what do we know a retail trader is? Retail trader is someone who trades their own money in the markets. Okay, that could be anybody. Probably sounds like you. Anybody that trades their own money. What you're gonna feel when you lose your own money? You're gonna feel bad. You're gonna feel fear. Fear is the greatest thing that stops people trading successfully because they don't want to lose money. Nobody wants to lose money. You know, we don't all have to be, you know, materialistic people, but nobody no, there's not a human being built that likes to lose money. So many websites, courses, webinars, all try to give you that education as a retail trader of what you should do. But think about this. If there's all these websites, all this kind of stuff that I'm teaching you what to do, then aren't the people that listen to it too and try and manipulate you? Okay? Yes. Yes, they are. I mean, I very much doubt hedge fund managers listening to my webinar now looking to, you know, manipulate you. But I'm talking about, the you know, the grander scheme of things. You know, the way things are. Okay, we all learn things in the same way from some sort of reference point. And things are right, things are wrong, some things work for us, some, some things don't. But at the end of the day, you know, we all learn in a certain respect. So if we all know the same thing and learn the same type of thing, isn't there a way that the bigger kind of guys with the bigger money would learn how we learn and then use that to their own gain? Makes sense, doesn't it? So retail traders, I guess the main issue is that, <clears throat> you know, we, we all tell people the same things and markets are complicated, sophisticated. And what I'm trying to teach people is, on all my webinars, what's important, give you the different aspects and let you make your own rules. I'm not going to tell you to buy low, sell high. Anybody can tell you that. I'm not going to tell you, you know, to use this combination of indicator oscillator. My whole point is I'm trying to teach you how to learn to be a trader. Okay. Once you learn how to learn for yourself, then there's ways you can interact with the market on your own. The whole point is why the retail traders fail because they're following that flock mentality. They're following that idea that there's one way to go all the time. There's not. You know, things can move up, they can move down. People can make money going up. They can make money when things go up and sell it. Things go down. They make money when they buy it. It's all about being right at the right time. The average view is that if you risk 1% or 2% of your capital at any one time, then you're going to be a sustainable trader. And that is absolutely right. However, the other side of this is if the entire market knows that you are a trader who's got 1% or 2% as a stop for their individual positions you know, based upon their account holdings, then that can be manipulated. The market can move easily three, four, five, six, seven, ten percent of you know people's accounts in a very short amount of time and get people stopped out. So going back to that stop grabber, that pin bar, you know, that short squeeze, this is what the market's trying to do. It's made to, trying to make you think you're wrong. And the market knows you're wrong because it knows the rules you play by. So I guess it's a dual edge, you know, dual edged sword. You, you know, you can't be right for being wrong. At the end of the day, if the market knows what you're thinking, the market knows how to manipulate you. And then, you know, that's a real big wake-up call to a lot of retail traders is that it doesn't really matter what you think or what you think you can control. You know, if the market knows what you're thinking, then you're at the mercy of the market. And that really is the main kind of crux of this uh, whole part of how banks trade your money. They know how to push the pain button and make you think you're wrong. I guess all the terms we spoke about, like stock grabbers, pin bars, is an example of how banks have almost created a world of which we are happy to get involved in and use and trade, and then they take it to another step. You know, all these kind of secret meetings, you know, these secret worlds of the bankers, it, it, they do exist. I mean, we have to, you know, have to be realistic about these things. You know, the, the banks are money-making machines. If they don't make money then you don't get your pension fund. You know, we don't get the tax revenues. We don't get the security of, you know, the city of London. But these things, you know, again, it's, it's all down 
to what we know. We all know the same things. I'm telling you, we all know the same things. So if I know this, you know this. You know banks don't make money for fun. We all like to demonize the bankers, hate them for their expensive lunches, blah, 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 blah. How do you think people make money? It's who you know, not what you know. This is the whole point, isn't it? The world moves in the same way it always has, but we just don't want to admit it, do we? I mean, if you want to demonize people that make too much money, demonize politicians. Public sector has a freeze, they get a pay rise. Demonize Lionel Messi, get paid a quarter of a million pounds a week. £250,000 a week to your football. Demonize that. At the end of the day, finance makes a colossal amount of money. It really is the lifeblood of most of our major city economies. So we can't really demonize these guys. We'd love to, but without them, there'd be no money for everyone else. No money for the health, you know, <clears throat> you know the NHS. No you know, help for the, the elderly. Without the kind of incomes from finance, Basically, property prices in London would probably fall about 70% and we'd all be in a massive recession. So if we want to get rid of finance, let's get rid of the world. You know, go back to the Stone Age. Do we want that? No. So we can't keep demonising these people. What's the, what's the point? At the end of the day, you know, we might not agree with it or like it, but it is what it is. It's something that brings a lot of money into what we all know. If you think about retail versus banks, think about this. The average retail trader has probably got, I'm being generous here, 10 grand on the deposit. If you're using 1 or 2% of your capital as a stop, right, that's 200 pounds offside position. So 200 pounds. Sorry, James, I, I don't understand. Is this live? I hope it's live. If it's not live, then I don't know. I don't know what's happening. We're in an alternate universe. So two hundred pounds based on ten thousand um, pounds. You know, it, it's it sounds a lot, but it's not. And that is your one or two percent, you know, offside position. So if you're trading three or four DAX, you know, in a fast-moving market on a ten thousand pound account, two hundred pounds. Well, it's literally nothing. By the time you paid your spread, it's not a lot of pain to take on board. But we can potentially make profit. And this is what all the banks know. They know how we trade. They know how other you know, institutions, hedge funds trade. And it's all about who can take the most amount of pain for the greatest amount of time and then profit. So again, things like short squeezes. I mean, you know, here's an example in gold. I mean, a short squeeze is that. A short squeeze is people want to go short a you know, specific product at a specific time, and the market doesn't let them. And again, you know, time is so relevant in trading because time is, I, I can tell you from personal experience, the most painful thing. So when things go up, you know it's going to go down, but you have to be right at the right time. So you're trying to go short gold because when I made this presentation, it was a, you know, a downward market, so you're expecting gold to go down here, but then that. That here is a short squeeze. So it does what you think, but you see that pin bar, that stop grabber, and gold goes up, it goes down. You think it's going to go down so people get, you know, short and stay short, and for no reason, it pops up and makes a pin bar of 58 ticks, and then it goes down. Again, a pin bar again, which means that, you know, buyers and sellers got involved in the market, but they moved it up and down for, you know, no reason very quickly, and then it went down. Another one here, you know, another pin bar, market goes down. So you write in your opinion that although gold can go up, it is going to go down, but it's being right at the right time. The market doesn't let you get involved, you know, with, with no pain. Okay, every time the market goes up, it comes back down. Um, that is an hourly time frame. So that's an hourly time frame. So quite a long time in trading. But again, look how, how long the markets move in these hourly candles. You know, quite big volumes. So when you see candles, yeah, that have these wicks, these fake outs, you know, the, these, you know, strong up and down movements, 58 pips, 50 pips, 58 pips, they come back down. But who can take on 58 pips offside, 60 pips offside? 
50 pips offside. The retail trader can't take that. And that is what I'm trying to say. The banks know along this level here, most people want to get short because it's a good level to short because, well, at that time, gold was going down. So all the low points, gold's going down. But when you want to sell gold, what happens? The opposite of what you think. And that's what's frustrating. You get a fake out. You get a fake out. You get a fake out. And gold, 58 pips, no retail trader can take 58 pips or so, 50 pips or 60 pips. But it's the same, isn't it? It's the same number of, of pips, pretty much. The market knows how to push retail traders out. Yeah, and the banks take the money, get short, and bang, profit, profit, profit. You know, it's not coincidence. That's happened three times in this one chart. It must happen 100 times every day across all the asset classes. So I guess, you know, we think about, you know, this, you know, gold trading in the bull market. Okay, the majority of traders are looking to go, uh, you know, short and sell it, you know, in every opportunity. So this is, you know, again, gold's back in vogue, so people are buying it. You know, stupid people that don't know any different. But monthly, we're down. Weekly, we're down. Daily, we're down. So if people, you know, are looking to get to $1,000 in gold, every time it sharply goes up with no reason, they'll get out. Because that's an opinion. That's how people trade. I mean, I guess think about what the bank's looking at. You know, the bank's looking at the average retail trader or the market, thinking in terms of direction, bullish, bearish. If you're bullish or bearish based upon the fundamentals, the technicals, they know that. Because if they know that, you know that. You build, we all build our opinions on the same information. The retail threshold is maybe 1% or 2%, 200 pounds. You know, think about this, you know, 50, 58 or 60 ticks before traders have to liquidate the positions if something goes against you. You know, that's a lot of pain. That's a lot of pain. I've been in the back of plenty of moves, you know, one, I think one and a half thousand pounds a point was my biggest amount of pain. And I was 42 ticks offside. That's an immense amount of pain. But that 40 ticks happened in seven minutes. And then an hour later, different story. So think about this. We all feel pain in the same way. I think over the last, you know, kind of way of looking at the charts and looking at different, you know, things we look at, <coughs> gold is a real bugbear for me. You know, I love and I hate gold. But if gold rallies, okay, we're looking to make new highs. So we see a trend. This is a trend. The market goes from low to the high. We then have some consolidation. But then the market comes down. It makes a top here. Market sells off. But what we're trying to do is, is that the top? Is that the overall end of the market? You know, at the end of the day, the banks are always going to get the highs and the lows and squeezes out. This is the whole point. Banks can always have more time, have more scope, have more aggression because they have more money. Banks and institutions, again, they exist because we let them. They exist because they hold our money and they use it against us. They give us interest. Oh, well, more likely they don't give us interest on our money and then now charge us to have our money and then go onto the markets and invest our money for us. I mean, it's a crazy, crazy situation. But we're talking about banks making billions in profits. Billions in profits. That is unreal. I guess when you think about banks and institutions, we essentially own the banks. So why don't we get more back? If we own the banks, the government owns the banks. We own the government. We pay for the government. Why am I getting more back? Because it's this panic, this fear, this greed, the global uncertainty, the nonsense that's spouted by people that have never had a real job and like to tell us how to run our lives. Well, that's just the way it is. So you can be frightened of banks, but banks can't make any money because they don't make any money. Then the whole system falls apart. If you don't make any money, we don't get taxes. If you don't make any money, we don't have jobs. If you don't make any money, then the world's coming to an end. So it's self-fulfilling. We need the banks to make money. Where are they going to get it from? You and I. How do they do it with our money? So it's pretty, pretty depressing when you think of it in them, in them terms. We don't really see banks any more as you know a, a place to hold our money securely. But you know, someone that invests for us, someone that we trust. And I guess trust is such a, a dual-edged sword. We put our money in the bank because we don't know what else to do with it. 
But again, the, the clear distinction is, you know, trading without money is not the same as investing. They trade money in the short term to make money in the short term to satisfy everybody else. I, I think the difference is between banks, institutions, etc. is, you know, they're re similar to retail traders, but, you know, you, we all like to you know, demonize, you know, bankers, but, you know, it was easy. We'd all do it, wouldn't we? We'd all trade. It was that easy to make money. Again, we'd all be millionaire footballers if we could play football. So, at the end of the day, we'd all be actors, golfers, whatever. Anything that makes lots of money is difficult. We have to understand that the world of trading and finance is difficult. The one thing's difficult is being right or wrong. That's all it is. There's no rule book about what says is right and wrong. It comes down to P and L money. So if you're trading against, excuse me, a bank or you're trading against another trader, all we keep score with is money. That's it. We keep score with money. We don't know anything else because that's the way the world is. You know, investing is buying. You know, holding things for longer term. Investing is something that you know people do you know, for future generations do something you know because of that element of time to just take out their ebbs and flows but trading is the market you know trading is buying and selling things in the short term and that's what the world has become we're not investing nations or investing people anymore we're traders and short term used to be i mean i think probably a year two years five years you know short term now is, is days weeks so again, you'll think about how banks trade your money. The majority of the world heard about Greece. So Greece, uh, negative deposit rates, you know, Germany's German bank run the EU. So shouldn't the euro be weaker? So what we're looking for is a trend in the euro where we should sell the euro based upon the underlying reason of Greece, the EU. And what happens? Okay, market's coming down, as we know. So the market gets to a high point, breaks up for absolutely no reason, and then sells back down. That's a pure example of a bank taking an advantage of the trend, what's going on, what people know, and then manipulating it for their own benefit. Now again, you know, think is you know most investors, most traders are going to go short. You know, you know, fundamental side of it is just opinion. That's people's opinion. But this is a trend. This is a trend here. This is what we know. This is technical trading. So when this happens, nobody knows why it happens. It's outside the sphere of technical trading. Okay, so the market should, from this point, hit a high and go down. It probably goes up 50 ticks, 60 ticks, coincidentally, probably 1% or 2% of the retail traders, and then comes down. So why, does the thing, why do you get stopped out of trades? Because banks know how you're trading, they know how you're positioned, they know what you're doing, and they do things to make you feel you're wrong. We're generally always right. So again, this is the kind of uh, institutional side. This is the retail side. And we can all make money, you know, have a short squeeze. We can all get involved with the markets the right way. But then the day, it's all down to timing. A retail trader can't be as wrong as a professional trader. So, again, price action is always important. Look at the size of these candles. You know, relatively small. You know, wicks, bodies, the same. What do you see when the banks get involved? A big tail. So, big tails give you that, just that, an indication that something unreal is happening. All right, guys, any thoughts, any questions about that? I mean, again, how banks trade the money is essentially, you know, looking back to how you trade, how you trade, how you learned, what you were told, and then understanding that banks know this and then basically trade around this. Right, any thought any final thoughts guys? Any any questions? Anything you'd like to ask? Well, I guess guys, anything you want to discuss, you know, about you know the wider economy, we can't really talk about it, you know, now it's, you know, this is about, you know, how banks trade. You know, if you get me on Twitter at Steve Roughly or at my email at S Roughly at com. that's probably the uh, the best way to uh, discuss out of you know kind of trading things. Alright guys, well listen, anything else you know to get me, it's been a pleasure. Alright guys, cheers guys, thank you, good night.